and I'm your host for ThinkFest 2024, day two. Welcome everyone. Today we have distinguished guests joining us to explore the topic of is populism the new democracy? Please welcome Ms. Audrey Rutrushke uh, from R Rutgers University, USA. Ms. Navida Khan from John Hopkins University, USA. Mr. Siddharth, The Wire India. Mr. Parvez, physicist and analyst with Musharraf Zaidi, partner Tabadlab. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Salaam uh, to everyone and welcome. Uh, great of you to join as well, Navida. Thank you for, for joining. No, 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 please don't, please don't apologize. You're just in time. I'm sure Siddharth will uh, arrive soon enough. I thought given such a large audience uh, having been here in time. So um, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll let Siddharth join us as we, as we come in. Uh, this is an interesting topic, uh, populism, and whether it's uh, the new democracy, whatever populism is and whatever democracy is, at least for me, it's hard to tell, A, the difference between the two, but even what they are individually on their is getting harder and harder to tell. Much like this microphone, which keeps turning off without warning, uh, democracy in many countries uh, keeps switching on and off, um, as does populism and popularity. Uh, I have a tendency of going on too long, so I'm gonna try and restrict my own comments and the length of my questions. But I did wanna frame, because the starting, starting point uh, for this, uh, for this, starting point for this conversation is populism or is tarah ke discussion mein oh uh, let me on the language issue kyunki mujhe to balki mujhe zyada khushi hoti hai ki hum urdu mein baat kar rahe hain aur meri chutti putti punjabi vich mein matlab gal kar rahe hain bhi mainu maza aata hai lekin itthe kyunki baharu log aaye ne sade guest ne sare jehde hai jehde urdu ya punjabi nahi samajh sakde bolde so we're going to we're going to conduct the conversation in english um, and i'll try my best to kind of weave in and out. Um, so with that caveat or that intro, and I don't need to introduce the, the panel, uh, everyone uh, on the panel is uh, both highly regarded and reasonably well known uh, for being brave and taking on positions that seem right. Uh, they're not scared of the large crowds, neither Siddharth, who's not here, uh, Navida I don't know as well, but she's an academic that studies a country that is very similar and in some ways very different from ours and studies topics that are very contentious. I've seen Audrey have to deal with trolls that are worse than the trolls that I have to deal with, much, much worse. My trolls are my brothers and sisters. Hers are a different nature. And then of course, Pervez Hoodboy, who's been right about a lot of things for a long, long time. Um, whether we disagree with him in the moment or not, uh, he continues to unwaveringly express uh, the realities as he sees them. So I think it's a great panel, and this topic is a great topic. But I'm going to frame my questions the way I see them, and they will not be popular uh, amongst this group. So I'm pre-warning that you won't like my questions, but hopefully, maybe you'll like the answers. Doc Sub, I'm, uh, I'm a little bit confused when I look at young people, the kind of people that come to think fests and literary fests, the kind of people that love you. You know, I kind of love you, but other people love you big. I, I, I look at these people and I'm very confused because the only thing standing between a 30-year populist wave in Pakistan, for example, would start, of course, with the next version of Imran Khan, and it would end with something between Saad Hussain Rizvi and something that we don't quite know, but that's borderline Taliban. That's what populism is gonna deliver in this country. And the only thing standing between that populism and us is the Pakistan army. And yet every liberal in Pakistan pretends that actually the problem is the Pakistan army. Why do populism and do Pakistan army? So I guess my, my starting point question is, why complain about populism if you know that democracy is going to deliver populism you don't like populism, you don't like the thing that protects you from that populism, and which in this country is, the, is not the constitution, it's the army. And 
you also like democracy. There's a lot of contradictions here. So I'd like you to help us resolve some of these contradictions. Dr. Hoodboy. So what we need to do is understand the roots of populism. And I think that at a very deep level, it lies in the structure of the human mind in terms of, so the human mind is very complex. Someday we'll get to understand it better. Neuroscience will help us, but until then, let's go by the empirical evidence that's around us. So populism starts by somebody rising up and saying, they are them and we are we. So the separation between us and them is the first step towards populism. And you see this in every case. You see this in the case of uh, Donald Trump. And by the way, my uh, only claim to fame over here, I'm uh, with experts in the area. My only justification for being here is that in 2014, I wrote an article called Pakistan's Donald Trump. And that was the very first time that Imran Khan had been compared with Donald Trump. Okay, but now let me resume my thread. Populism begins by saying us versus them. In every case you see this. In the case of Narendra Modi, it's Hindus, us versus Muslims, them. Donald Trump, us white Americans, they Muslims, Latinos, everybody else. In the case of Imran Khan, what I wrote in 12, 2014 was, it's us, they are the West. Those who bomb Afghanistan, it's the liberals who make us wear clothes like them, who destroy our cultural identity. And so we are the Muslims under threat from the West. So it's always us versus them. Then you have to have somebody who peddles a myth, who creates a myth and is capable of selling it to a very large audience. In the case of um, Narendra Modi, it is that there was back in the deep past a Hindu civilization which was uh, capable of everything under the sun sending rockets to Mars and uh, regular space traffic between Mars and, and Earth. The first plastic surgery, the first flying machine, etc. In the case of Donald Trump, the myth is that we need to make America great again. And so that's where we have to aim. In the case of Imran Khan, it is that we need to go back to our roots. We, don't, we need to recreate the Riyasate Medina, where everything was perfect, where there was no hunger, no want. And we need to, of course, level the playing field, so make all the schools in the country have the same syllabus. And therefore, as we saw at the end, we had the madrasas and the regular public schools having the same curriculum, and that's the single national curriculum. So that, I think, is the essence of all of these cases, it's bypassing democracy. Now, we saw that Donald Trump didn't believe in the institutions of American democracy. We saw that in the attack on the American Hello. capital. We, in the case of Narendra Modi, we saw how riots were engineered, how the Supreme Court was manipulated. And ditto for Imran Khan, where Today, his survival hinges upon the judicial system, but earlier on, he held both the judicial system and the parliament in contempt. So I think these are the broad features of populism. And now it's not just the three cases that I mentioned. It's a broader political phenomenon. You see this in the case of Duterte in the Philippines. You see this in the case of Hungary, Orban etc. And so we are in a very different stage of human history where liberal democracy is being threatened by populism. I'll stop over there so that we can then proceed. 
Well, I'll come back to you because you didn't really answer my question, but that's fine. I'll, I'll repeat the question. But Audrey, I'll just I'll just go in order, uh, and it's great to have you. So that I started with, I, I tried to provoke Dr. Huthboy, but he didn't take the bait. I, I asked him what his problem was. If the army in this country protects us from populism, um, you know, then then we should actually. Uh, you know, that's not quite true. That populism was made possible because of the army. Okay. Who do you think? Now, thank you. See, Who we have do you to think organized that Minare Pakistan rally here in Lahore? Who October do you think? 2011. That was 2011. Who do you think engineered the Fazabad episode where you had the DG of the Rangers handing out 1,000 rupee notes to all the rioters who came over there? Good. So now we have the crowd into it and, and we have some excitement. Audrey, uh, you've, uh, you study, I think, in great depth uh, what's been happening in India for a long, long time. And I guess maybe the way that Dr. Hoothboy described it, it's this us versus them phenomenon. But the us versus them has been there. This attempt in India, for example, and I'll ask Siddharth to speak more about this, that stuff has been around for 100 years. So what is it about now? that is unique or different. Why are we talking about populism now? Clearly, we're talking about it because democratically, these are the people that are winning elections. Uh, it, may, it may be true that whether it's in India or in other places, there is some deep-seated, uh, what is it called, the deep state or the establishment or the uber elites in this country. It's the military, but every country has a version of this kind of power, maybe varying degrees of ability to exercise that power. Uh, there, there was a, an establishment in the United States that enabled Donald Trump. So before, this didn't happen, and now it's happening. What's this change that took place? Maybe, I don't know when it happened, maybe you can tell us, but it feels like something changed in the mid-2000s. And since then, we've been on this kind of roller coaster that's only going one way, that is up, 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 and up. Um, and we're waiting for the fall. Uh, and maybe we're waiting for something that won't happen. So what what's changed? So thank you so Thank you so much for, for having me and for everyone here. Um, it's a great question, sort of why, why now? As many of you will know, Hindutva or Hindu nationalism or Hindu supremacy, you can use all of those as synonyms, has been around for about 100 years, with roots maybe going back about 140 years, 1880, sort of at the earliest, with a clearer articulation in the 1920s. And yet the, the Hindu far right has had marginal political power until relatively recently. Um, let me say something about the anxieties which Hindu, to which Hindutva speaks as a political ideology, and then I'll say something about the sort of why now. So I think one of the key anxieties that is helpful to understanding Hindu supremacy concerns the sort of nature of the Hindu community as such, as a singular community. This is the, thinking about Hindus as sort of one group, this, this is not something that goes far back. In, in Indian history, okay? Um, the word Hindu is not a Sanskrit word. It's a Perso-Arabic word. It was first brought by outsiders trying to describe not a religious community, but the people of the subcontinent. The word Hindu was not used self-referentially by Hindus within any kind of widespread or systematic way until about 1800 on forward, with the word Hinduism only coined in 1800. And so I think this anxiety comes up as part of modernity, okay? And it comes up in, in it, it gets exacerbated by particular events, most notably the institution of the British census in the early 1870s. When you start counting people and you start thinking about who has power and who do we give positions to and who gets reservations, and then a bit later when it's clear that independence will happen somehow at some point, who is going to be the majority, it becomes very important to suddenly stop talking about various communities within Hinduism and to start talking about the Hindu community in the singular. And Hindu supremacist ideology does a very good job at that. But when Hindutva first gets going in the 1920s, I think it's hampered by a lot of things. It's a violent movement from the get-go, and this is critical. Hindu nationalism and violence have always gone together. This is very clear in the writings of Savarkar, the sort of godfather of, of Hindutva ideology. This makes Hindu nationalists a problem from the start for the state, 
Okay, and the first that state is British colonialists, but after 1947, that state is run by the Indian Congress. Okay, and they see Hindu nationalists as every much every bit the threat that that the British did. I think it also becomes hampered, particularly with one event in 1948, which is the assassination of Mohandas Gandhi, right, the legendary Indian freedom freedom fighter, except fighting without violence, most notably. And that assassination was carried out by an RSS man. And I know that the RSS denies that today, and that is one of many of their bits of mythology, right? An RSS guy definitely carried out that assassination. And as a result, no respectable Indian wants to touch Hindutva for decades. Who would want to be associated with the murderers of Gandhi? But time passes and memories fade. And I think that the fading of that memory starting in the 1980s, combined with India's emergency in the late 1970s, in which democracy is abrogated and Hindu nationalists are among the many groups who are sort of negatively impacted by, by that abrogation, those factors combined then lead to the founding of the BJP and the sort of rising of that political party. The last thing I'll say is just a, a sort of, perhaps ironic coming from me, but a plea for sort of understanding, if not agree, uh, not agreeing, but understanding the attraction of Hindu supremacy. It is really attractive if you are in the majority to say you can have more rights than other people. Your version of Hinduism, that can be the right version. Okay, we hear parallel arguments like this in Pakistan, your version of Islam, that's real Islam, that's us the Islam, not, not the Ahmadiyya or somebody else, right? You can have more rights, you can have better economic opportunities, all of these things. And for a generation that remembers what it was like to have a pluralistic society with at least approaching more equal rights for everyone, at least you have the memory of the contrast and a better way of life. But especially for young people who do not remember India before Hindutva, I think it can be a, a, an almost irresistible attraction. So uh, this is a really interesting point that you make, and I want to, Navida, I want to ask you about uh, not just about Bangladesh, um, and, and I also want to make the point that populism, which is the topic, isn't something restricted to Hindu supremacists in India. And it's certainly not restricted to uh, Muslim extremists uh, or, or Muslim fundamentalists in Pakistan or in Bangladesh. Uh, Dr. Saab already alluded to what I think is really the most concerning populist wave in the world, which isn't where there are brown or black uh, or colored people, but where, where there's white European nationalism uh, right across the entire continent, and they already have quasi or proto-fascist regimes in, in some of these countries. The most obvious case is Orban, but you know I think Poland has had a close shave, uh, and and we don't know how long that is escape is. We know Italy is deep in the throes, and luckily there's the Russia consolidation, so there's some some solidarity there between uh, non-alike sort of characters and leaders in Europe. This idea that populism is necessarily associated with one type of ideology, which is religious or identity-based, doesn't really play out in reality. There are other kinds of na populism that aren't necessarily religious or ethnic or, or linguistic. So is populism, I mean, I guess maybe I'm asking you to help define uh, you know, the difference, because in some ways, what happened in Bangladesh in the mid-2000s was a very populist movement led by an entirely secular sort of nationalist leader uh, who didn't have any of these problems of either Hindu supremacy or Muslim supremacy or any other kind of white European supremacy, but you know, a kind of, hey, let's get our country back on track. And yet we see some of that now from a democracy perspective. A lot of the people that celebrated that, that emergence are now not celebrating it. So what, how, does this, how does this all work? Um, okay, first of all, I should uh, put in a caveat to say I'm an anthropologist of climate and of environment, so I think it was a little sleight of hand to put me on this panel <laughs> to talk about populism, but I think uh, my place here is to ponder the situation of, the situation of uh, populism from the perspective of Bangladesh, which is where I do my field work. Uh, as an anthropologist of um, 
of Bangladesh, of trying to think about how Bangladesh fares in the region, but also within international climate negotiations, I've had an opportunity to really look at, uh, you know, how our ruling party operates at many different levels. I'm thinking about the Awami League, uh, we just recently won uh, elections, having taken something like 250 or 230 uh, seats out of the 300. You can see that you know it has uh, a quality of the populist in the way that uh, they come in, uh, winning elections, having taken all seats and claiming 50% participation. So in a way, they don't even have to uh, 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 to support that with actual numbers. They know that people in Bangladesh will just quiescently take those uh, numbers, right? So it's a very different kind of populism than the populism we here talked about um, in the context of India or even in Pakistan. It's one that uses uh, electoral policy, uh, uh, you know, electoral democracy to keep perpetuating itself, right? And so as an anthropologist, having lived in, uh, you know, particular villages in Bangladesh in you know, in really, really remote parts of Bangladesh, what I've had an opportunity to see is just how deep uh, the roots are into the village structure, right? So it isn't simply about calling in the masses, showing up in the streets of Dhaka, you know, uh, uh, for, uh, and also rounding people up for votes. It's about a steady building of party alliances down to the very households at the village level, such that when you have something like this election, you can count on there not being a um, groundswell of discontent or a uh, resistance, right? So at that level, when you have a Wami League operating and villages, you can see how it is that, for example, the Bangladesh Nationalist Party, which used to be the leading uh, opposition till about, uh, uh, about five or seven years ago, uh, you can see how it is that that dismissal of an opposition happens, again, not at the national level, not in the streets of Dhaka, but it happens on an everyday level within village life. Right? Such that when BNP doesn't, uh, 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 you know, um, uh, get to be <coughs> involved in elections, uh, there isn't enough BNP organizing at that ground level to be able to protest that, right? So we're talking about a kind of populism which is ac absolutely sort of rooted in institution building, right? And if you think about the usual sorts of ways in which populism is talked about, it's seen as something that privileges people's will, popular sovereignty, and uh, is extremely derisive or extremely contemptuous of uh, the sort of uh, institutions that you associate with liberal democracy, right? Whereas in the context of Bangladesh, what you see is how the very architecture of liberal democracy is well mobilized by the government in order to ensure its perpetuation and to ensure a mass kind of support for it, right? So that's just to give you a sense of like how, uh, in response to your question about can you specify what populism is, it doesn't look the same everywhere. And you know, how it is different from the various examples we got from Professor Hooper. Uh, and so I don't know if that's an answer. No, that's a fantastic response. I want to just quickly follow up before I sort of ask Siddharth, uh, you know, uh, a question about India. Is there a risk with the, maybe the, and I'm gonna pretend that I'm Bangladeshi and I have to go back to Dhaka, yeah. so I'm gonna choose my words carefully. Is there a risk that the robust extravagance with which liberal democracy has been reshaped to suit Sheikh Has uh, Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina's agenda, that that is creating a groundswell of unseen and invisible, but mobilizing capable uh, opposition on the fringes. Uh, violent extremists have manifested themselves at the Paris uh, restaurant, uh, the French restaurant, sort of Daesh attack, uh, which is now a while ago. But that fear, I think a lot of, at least outsiders, continue to carry this fear about Bangladesh. Is that well-founded, that there's something bubbling underneath that architecture of consensus and popular will that the Prime Minister has built? So I think this is actually an incredibly skilled uh, uh, um, um, leader, right? In the sense that she both plays off uh, secular uh, constituencies, and this is not just the elite. 
by and large, there is a very large uh, secular bent to uh, even Muslims, Muslim Bengalis, right? And so she plays <coughs> off um, their fears and uh, puts herself forward as a, you know, a, as providing a certain kind of, uh, you know, the army-like position uh, in, in the case of uh, Pakistan, um, you know, uh, providing some sort of like so, uh, a dam against uh, the groundswell of radical extremism. But at the same time, she's been extremely, extremely skillful in the way that she's also utilized Islam, right? And so there are, at the level of villages, uh, groups that are associated with the Wami League, but are also very much, you know, have an Islamic agenda, right? Okay. And so as a result, I would say that it's actually not so clear. The, the, the lines are not radical versus secular. It's uh, very much in terms of, you know, um, a kind of capture of resources. Yeah. Who has it at what level? Fantastic. Uh, Siddharth, there's a tendency, I think, and probably an expectation that anybody reasonable from India would come to a conference like this and basically, you know, there's a bit of that that's already happened. We kind of gang up on, you know, the manifestation of what its proponents call Hindu nationalism and what somebody like me as an outsider calls Hindu supremacist ideology. But whatever an outsider like me calls it, what I'm really wondering is what is the problem that Indians themselves have with this, given that Prime Minister Narendra Modi has delivered the most spectacular economic growth, sustained economic growth that India could have possibly imagined. This is a country that's already one of the largest in the world economically. It is the largest country in the world by population. It's going to be an $8 trillion economy in 2030. And largely, every reform that is fueling this change this prosperity among the Indian people has come from Prime Minister Narendra Modi and the r deep recesses of both the RSS and the BJP. So uh, at some level, I wonder why an Indian would even, like what is the, why, why are people complaining? Why is this not something that is even more popular? I think his last uh, poll numbers were 80 plus percent favorable. So clearly most Indians are on board. Sure, it's, it, it's not comfortable for Audrey or for maybe Dr. Hoodboy or for Musharraf, but why would it be uncomfortable for Indians? I mean, it, this is populism working the way it should. It's delivering for the people. Masla kya hai? Or try to explain what I, I think is the issue with populism. Uh, or what we mean by populism, or what this word is attempting to capture. Because I'm frankly not a, a huge proponent of this term or this word. I think it, it, uh, it blurs crucial differences that exist in the nature of many of these regimes across the world. Uh, but if I were to try to explain uh, what it is that we're trying to get at, uh, I'll start with a, a joke people, you know, Russian election under Putin, where was that the joke? Uh, <laughs> I'm coming to that. No, they have they have them. They have them. But uh, this is the joke, right? So so a guy goes into the polling station, and he gets handed an envelope, and he says, "Please put this in the box." So he starts to open the envelope, and the election official says, "But what are you doing?" He said, "But I want to see who I'm voting for," and the official says, "You can't. It's a secret ballot, right?" So. <laughs> So, you know, elections, right, uh, are just, you know, we tend to assume that populism contra liberal democracy, uh, that everything is, everything was rosy and great in the way liberal democracies function. Uh, the reality is that in many countries uh, which have had liberal democratic systems or variants of that, Elect electoral outcomes are the product of money power. Uh, and I'm li listing them in this particular order. Money power, um, ab ability to direct and control media discourse. And I, I would say in today's era over the last 10, ten years, uh, social media discourse. Third, uh, what my friend Ajayas Heather, he introduced me to a wonderful phrase this morning called shaping operations. Uh, it's a military term where before you attack a target, you kind of soften it up. 
So before elections, uh, the powers that be engage in preparatory, uh, you know, conduct. Uh, it may mean filing criminal cases against opposition leaders or uh, ensuring that they don't get their election symbol or that their party is not recognized or whatever. Uh, the point is that this this X factor of institutions in a country also manipulating the outcome in some way, that's factor number three. And the fourth, of course, is popular choice. And popular choice is also a f is a function of these three first three elements, but also a sense of public disenchantment with the manifest failure of liberal democratic regimes to deliver uh, over not just years, but decades. So Donald Trump, no, it's a different matter. How could people in America possibly we have been fooled by the richest man in the country claiming to, you know, be opposed to the establishment, quote unquote, right? How, are, how do people even get taken in by this kind of stuff? But they do, because, because there is a sense in which you are so uh, upset and angry at the failure of the system as it exists to deliver. You see manifest uh, injustices, inequalities, problems in your quality of life. And you say, okay, fine, let, let me go for, for an alternative. So in India, to come to your question, in, in 2014, you had the migration of big money defected from the BJP to Congress, sorry, from Congress to BJP, I would say around 2011 or 2012 two or three years before the 2014 election, big capital decided that Manmohan Singh and the Congress ain't cutting it for us. They're not delivering. Was there some manipulation of the public discourse around the role of the media? There was something called the Radia tapes, and there was a no, lot of... No, no, I, I, would say, I would say that, I, I think the Radia tapes was not manipulation. Uh, in fact, the Radia tapes were, were in a way suppressed because the Radia tapes highlighted the, uh, you know, kind of relationship between big business and government and their ability to swing things and so on. It didn't play a very big role. Uh, but big money decided that if we want ease of business, uh, we need somebody like Narendra Modi. So in fact, the captains of Indian industry, beginning from 2011, 2012, Anil Ambani, Mukesh Ambani, of course, Gautam Adani, uh, uh, christened Mr. Modi as a future prime minister of India. And it's unthinkable in, in a country like India where any big business, you know, business still has a lot of interaction with the government, right? But they, they said, no, we want this guy. They made it very clear that we want him as PM. And uh, along with once big money made its choice, uh, a major section of the media uh, also swung into action. And of course there was disenchantment. How could there not be uh, in a country where half the people are poor? Uh, where, you know, jobs weren't being created, where the fruits of growth and development which were manifest visibly were not trickling down the way they were meant to. So you have the media selling what was called the Gujarat model. And people, people bought into that. And of course, uh, there, there was also the, uh, what the BJP calls its cultural agenda but which is the Hindutva politics, which played a, played a role in uh, all, you know, delivering a decisive blow. But I think that the, 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 the upsurge in the Bharati Janata Party's vote share in 2014 that Mr. Modi accomplished, he raised the vote share by around 10%, was largely on the basis of young, young, young voters uh, is thinking that, well, maybe the economy will grow faster, maybe we will benefit, maybe there will be more jobs. So there was this kind of aspirational uh, you know, quotient which Mr. Modi tapped into and which I think delivered him the vote. Uh, I don't then my question was that then he delivered against it. No, he did it. not. Well, he he, he well, the Indian he, growth story is no, no, not no, no, something no, 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 that no, can be let, contested, let let, is it? No, let, let me give you a corrective there because, because I think that uh, the fact is that I would seriously contest and so would many uh, economists and statisticians that the growth record of the last nine years under Mr. Modi is any different or necessarily better than what was delivered in the decade before, just in terms of sheer numbers, right? Now, you get to, a, and in fact, I would say the mishandling by Mr. Modi 
the demonetization, you know, completely idiotic, ill-advised move to get rid of, you know, 80% of currency uh, and not, not even planning for it to replace it with notes quickly, right? Uh, and then the botched implementation of uh, the goods and services tax. Then you had, I would say, the you know, calamitous mishandling of COVID. You know, who announces a lockdown uh, without even preparing for transport facilities and food and emergency you know, uh, provision for the workers who then get chucked out of their jobs and have to walk on foot, right? So, uh, so you know, there's been a lot of mishandling of the economy. I would say that the growth would have been much higher but for all of these things. And I think today, yes, India is the fastest growing economy in the world, or perhaps the second. But uh, in terms of job delivery, in terms of job creation, in terms of uh, uh, equality, uh, share of wealth, there are very, very serious problems. And I think Mr. Modi and his government are aware of this. And, and the problem is, is the root of the problem populism? Whatever your issues with that term are, is, is that the problem? No, the, the, I mean, I would say, if you set aside that term, you know, what you have is, is classic, you know, any, and around the world, governments which fail to deliver on people's expectations will do their utmost to then try to divert people's attention away from that non-performance to other things, right? So in the case of India, they say, oh, let's, let's build it, you know, we're building this temple. This is the biggest, you know, greatest contribution. So you haven't got a job, uh, Mr. Modi hasn't delivered, doesn't matter. Right, so you're, you're appealing to other instincts of people, uh, and in a way the media has helped create that ground. Uh, so you wanna call that populism, fine, I would call it, you know, I would say this is religious chauvinism, this is communalism, uh, uh, you know, it's, it, it, whatever term you want to attack. But whatever it is, it seems to be working for India at the macro level and for Narendra Modi as a politician. Well, so that, see, I, I wanna come back to yeah. this, but I wanna bring uh, Dr. Hoodboy back into this. Something Siddharth said that really resonated with me is that this whole thing about basically people or institutions or organizations that fail to deliver then try to distract people. And it almost seems like Pakistani Democrats have made a habit of targeting in particular the, the deep state or the establishment in this country. But the actual failures that fuel populism, it may be that the military helped conceive of, you know, Imran Khan as a leader or other kinds of populist startups, but the startups end up being wildly successful and they are genuinely popular. Imran Khan is genuinely popular today. You know, whatever the history of that may be, uh, that populism that he that he's able to connect with people, according to Siddharth, is because there's a failure. When we complain about populism, is it enough to just complain about the conduct of leaders without also exploring the failures that led to that demand for such leadership? The leadership that says, Hamidar or Tumudhar, which is how you describe, you know, the kind of the mindset of the populist. Well, there have been two populist leaders in Pakistan, one Zulfiqar Ali Bhutto, the other Imran Khan. And your question is really what made it possible for them to rise? And of course, the answer is a deep feeling of dissatisfaction, a feeling that the system has failed people, and a hope that those populist leaders will somehow fix things. Now, everyone knows how deep corruption is in Pakistan. It's there in the milkman, it's there in the bureaucrats, it's there in the politicians, and above and beyond all else, is there in the generals. Now here comes Imran Khan and says that in 19 days, one nine, I will eliminate corruption in Pakistan. He later changed it to 90 days. Then he says, I will bring to you Riyasat Madina, in which there is no poor and no rich, and so the dreams of equality. And he said, I will, I am from HSN College, but now HSN College will teach what is taught in every school in Pakistan. And the madrasas will be teaching science and technology, and everybody will be happy. And he promised the heavens. He said, I will never go back to the IMF. I hate these Goras. I will never emulate them. Well, three years, three and a half years later, 
which of these promises was even slightly fulfilled. Today, we have gone back to the IMF for what, the 23rd time? We have as much corruption as before, and in fact, Mr. Clean has proved to be corrupt himself. He dipped his fingers into <laughs> the public till, stole from the Tosha Khana, but let that be. But it's the deep feeling of, of dissatisfaction that brings these populists. And you see, they have a magic to them. That's that charisma which somehow attracts masses of people to them. And so, so I guess my look, question. Look, pop singers can do it too. Sure. And so can politicians. There's sure. No, and I mean, we have a comedian. Yeah. We have a comedian in, in Ukraine that's doing it. We have, we have all sorts of examples. But I guess then that's my original confusion stands. And, and again, uh, maybe I'll ask you to help me and then we'll move to Audrey. It sounds like these guys have this magic to them and there's these pre-existing failures. And obviously we're not happy about the fact that these populists become popular and become powerful. But then what's the solution? Should we stop having elections and stop listening to the people? Because no matter what, we all agree. I mean, there might be people here who like the notion of Irmat Khan being called corrupt, but you know, in most crowds in Pakistan, I mean, we'd get booed down for, for being on stage while that's being said. So I, I guess, again, the question isn't the reality or the truth or the haq of it, but the reality in terms of what's there is that if he runs in a free and fair election today, he will win. We don't like populists. Does that mean we don't like democracy? No, 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 absolutely. We must have democracy for all its faults, and there are very many of them. The fact is, yes, Imran Khan is popular. The fact is that today he is aligned against the military. The fact is that the military has sucked the country dry. And so this puts us in a real dilemma, who to vote for. And at this point, if you were to ask me, go ahead, ask me. I'm asking. Who, am I gonna <laughs> who are you going to vote for, Dr. Yeah. Pervez Hoodboy? January 14th, 2024. <laughs> You know, I just might vote for Imran Khan. Whoa. <laughs> okay. So, so from, from the ridiculous to the sublime, Audrey, <laughs> I, uh, I, I guess, you know, okay, Pakistan's a big, poor country. It's had a really troubled sort of history. It's a new formulation. It's a very young country. And so a lot of this complexity, frankly, I mean, we beat ourselves up for it, but you guys have been around for like 200 years. I'm assuming you're American? Yes. Awesome. So you guys have not, figured not everything out. Awesome. You're, the global, you're the global superpower. Surely you don't have the kind of deep poverty that the Indians have, which is why they needed Modi, or that we have plus all the other problems we have, so we need Imran Khan. What was the compulsion for you guys needing Donald Trump to make people feel better? <laughs> I'm not asked to speak on American politics all that often, uh, but, but I, will, I will try. So I think there's a few things to know. One is that the United States does have deep and endemic poverty. Okay, It doesn't look quite the same as it does here. But especially in the American rural South, we have houses without electricity, without running water, schools are terrible. Um, illiteracy does continue to be a problem in America at lower levels, but, but it's, it's still a huge social problem. The wealth gap is enormous in America and growing. This is something that we see in Pakistan as well as in India, of course. There's that. There's always, in America, racism. That's a huge thing, okay? And there, <laughs> yeah, we, we, we clapping against racism, right? Um, so, and we, we have multiple kinds of racism in America. We really go in for a smorgasbord on this one. Um, we, have, we have sort of general racism against any pe person of color, okay? We also have specifically anti-black racism, and that is the most deep-seated and insidious in American culture. It is absolutely foundational to the American sort of political and social projects, and it's very hard to get rid of. And so to answer part of the attraction of Donald Trump is that he made it okay to be overtly racist again. This is a constant issue in American politics. How racist can you openly be? What can you get away with saying in a room where people are of different ethnic backgrounds? 
what can you get away with saying in a room where it's all white people, all right? And you, you can always get away with more in the all white crowd than you can in the mixed crowd. But Donald Trump sort of, you know, he, I don't know, raised or lowered, however we think of it. You could be more racist all around after him. That was a big part of the attraction. Another critical thing, and I'll end on this to understand, is that Trump was not elected with a majority in 2016, okay? He lost the American popular vote by millions. It was not close. This is true, by the way, of all Republican presidents who have been elected in the last, I don't know, 20, 30, 40 years. I'd have to look up, all right? The key issue here is that America is not a sort of full, straightforward democracy. We have this sort of complex pseudo-Republican system where some votes in some states count more than others. So you have to win the majority of the states to become president, not the majority popular vote. And those two often do diverge. And so sort of circling back to the question of, you know, do we just say, oh, you know, if, the, if people vote for it, I guess populism is the new democracy. Absolutely not. What would save America from populism going into the next election is if we actually had a true and straightforward democracy. That, that's a really interesting point. And I want to I wanna ask both of you really quick sort of uh, for, for quick responses. And then I want to bring uh, the group that's here and, and get some of those questions in. Navida, you, as an anthropologist, how much of this do you associate with, not blame on, but associate with the emergence of social media technology? Because, you know, a lot of the, the, it's all happening at the same time. It's happening to white Europeans. It's happening to Americans. It's happening to Pakistanis in much uh, calmer measure, I would say, than some other places. It's happened in India. Is technology the overriding underlying factor? I mean, I think uh, social media is not only about uh, people accessing uh, one another and different kinds of extremist platforms, misinformation, et cetera. It's also a means by which the state embeds itself into everyday lives of people. So I think that we have to understand it in a more complex fashion as opposed to people just consuming media in an uncritical way to also think about the way in which states uh, have begun to really embed themselves much more in people's lives such that they feel a constant sense of being surveilled. And this was very evident under COVID, uh, where, you know, under the guise of stopping misinformation, there was very clear sort of policing of people's words um, of criticism against, you know, uh, politicians and how they were responding to uh, COVID in terms of uh, not being sufficiently alert to people's uh, problems. So that's what I, I, I don't know if that's. Well, it, it, yeah. well, well, I mean, this is, I think we could have hours of discussion on these topics, but Siddharth, just to quickly sort of bring you in before we go to the audience for their questions, just on this question of technology, in the recent Bangladesh election, we had examples of disinformation, misinformation, AI generated fake news. You know, when we think of Bangladesh, it's a big country and a very important country, but we have an election coming up in India. And I just, I'm trying to imagine what the conversation within India is like in terms of the mix between populism and the use of technology or the misuse of technology to fuel and sustain populist leaders like Modi. Yeah. I think the first uh, point I want to make is that um, one should not separate media from social media. Um, in fact, media, media output, and in, and in India, sadly, uh, the vast section of electronic television media has stopped functioning as professional media and have become cheerleaders for the establishment. Uh, many of them have become openly communal in terms of their programming. It's very shocking. Uh, and they set the tone and the signal, which is then picked up, amplified by uh, real people or bots or IT farms uh, on social media. More importantly, real media has, I mean, the, the big media has done something which is, perhaps you see this in Pakistan too, but in India, a coarsening of the level of discourse. So it's impossible to have civilized arguments anymore with people, you know, among people who disagree with each other. And uh, it's, you know, invariably uh, people descend to name calling. Uh, 
but beyond name calling, what we've begun to see now is a tendency to file criminal cases. You don't like what somebody says, you don't like what they teach in class, you don't like a particular movie. You'll have somebody going and filing a police complaint and then getting that person ensnared in, in, uh, in legal uh, processes for the next 10 years. This aspect of public life today, uh, which is uh, you know, a reality, has, uh, has really queered the pitch. And just final point, you know, uh, the point Audrey made about the uh, actual num voting numbers. I would say in India too, I would caution against looking at one prime minister being in power for 10 years and assuming that the majority of Indians think in a particular way. They don't. Uh, the share of popular vote <coughs> that prime ministers who, win, who come to power get in India, uh, I think Mr. Modi's was 38%. And this was an election fought on the basis of are you with Modi or against? And 52% of Indians chose the other side. It's a different matter that in the you know, first past the post system which exists, uh, you have an outcome. And you know, everybody should respect that because that's the system. But I think that we should refrain from making very sweeping judgments about what Indians want or what Pakistanis want or what Americans want simply on the basis of who wins an election. I think incredibly nuanced, and I think the point you made, just I wanted to acknowledge the ThinkFest team. This is the seventh consecutive year of ThinkFest, and what Siddharth said about having conversations between people who disagree that are civilized and respectful and even warm, that's really something that I think has been taken away from us over the last decade, decade and a half, I think primarily thanks to the nature of social media. So I thank all of you, and I thank the organizers and, and everyone that's here, I think, for having these conversations. And on that note, uh, thank you for that applause. That's for Yakub Bangash and all the organizers, including yourself and everybody, all the hosts at ThinkFests and, and everybody else that made this happen. Uh, it's good to acknowledge uh, things like that. Uh, we'll take, I think, three questions. We'll start with uh, Madam right behind the camera right there, and then we'll go to the brother in the scarf over there, and then the, the green, is that green? Yeah, look, you. Okay, so, I, Madam, please. Yeah. Okay, I want to ask, what do you think in this evolution of democracy, are we missing that is paving way for populist leaders like Imran Khan or Modi? What is that factor that we've missed on that is helping them come in? So, yeah, well, what's missing and, you know, what are the alternatives? And then second question is right here. Uh, hello. So my question is rather anthropological. So I, mind, I wanted to ask, that, especially after the rise of social media presence, uh, can we say that uh, it is uh, innate in human nature that we seek to find thrill, um, which we can see through the populist leaders, especially like Imran Khan in the last... Uh, since he has been elected, uh, especially after 2014. Could you could you move your mic away? Because I, I couldn't make yeah. out what you're saying. Yeah, I was saying that, uh, uh, especially after the rise of social media, I would say that uh, it is innate human nature that we we seek to find thrill and hope, uh, which can come through the populist leaders like Imran Khan and Nidra Modi or Donald Trump, as a matter of fact, because they give something new to the population. Sure, they, they're exciting. So that's a second question. And then the third one is over there in the... Okay, so we all know democracy is the worst form of government, ex except for all those other forms that have been tried. So democracy is the Hobson choice for us. And we all know that democracy lies largely on the populism. So why is it so that what is the, what is the mechanism to eliminate the populism fr uh, from the democracy or is it the only solution for the democracy? And secondly, we all know that the electoral process fails to meet the demands of democracy. Is it due to the failure of structural democracy in the country, Pakistan, or, we are a or is it due to the populist democracy where the popular leader tries to corrupt all the process? Okay, that also a great question. Who wants to take any of those? Audrey, do you want to start? Yeah. So it seems to me that running through sort of all these three questions is a sort of bit of lack of appreciation for all that democracy has brought us. Folks, without democracy, you have no say in your government. You do not have human rights, you do not have civil rights, and you do not have economic growth either. All of those things are absolutely dependent on having a free society, right? 
Pakistan is not considered to be a free society. It is not considered by international bodies to have fully functioning elections. So insofar as the question is why Pakistan is having problems, I would point to that as, as a direct answer. So far as sort of excitement goes and, and sort of why this keeps happening, I mean, I would say a couple of things. One is do not underestimate control of the media, right? And Siddharth mentioned this. We've seen this very strongly in India, and we're seeing it in the United States as well. Having control of the media, that controls what you know, that controls what you think, and the kinds of questions that you can ask, right? And freedom of the press is something that is only possible within fully functioning democracies. So far as excitement, I don't know. To me, what is exciting are things like the ability to criticize my government as much as I want, in any terms that I want, anywhere I want, and in any language I want, and for that to never be a problem for me. It will never stand in the way, hopefully, <laughs> at least as, as America stands now, of me getting a job, or of my husband getting a job, right? My husband works for the federal government. It's not a problem for me to criticize America. That's what's exciting to me. Please. I'm also coming from the United States, teaching there, and I've actually seen something quite worrying there in terms of how it is that the discourse of anti-Semitism is used to, um, you know, really uh, press back against uh, the criticism of one's government. Uh, and so I think that what I would like to suggest is that institutions of democracy are extremely hard fought, but extremely vulnerable and fragile no matter where they are. And so I don't necessarily think that America has a, um, has a monopoly on that, right? It doesn't have a, uh, a, a, a way to actually deal with the fragility of democracy. And so consequently, it's something that has to be thought about and thought over all the time. I, I just to take that, please, Dr. Hudboy, and then I'll have a follow-up question for you, uh, Navida. I think Pakistan started in extraordinarily difficult circumstances for democracy to flourish because it was founded on the two-nation theory, which simply said that Hindus and Muslims cannot live together, and as a consequence of which, the structure of the Muslim League was entirely that of landlords and just a sprinkling of capitalists. It was the other way around in the case of India where the, where the socialist, nationalist doctrine of uh, Nehru was used to effect land reform almost instantly, a year, year and a half after partition. But land reform never took place in Pakistan, and that meant that the grounds on which democracy could be built were not there then. However, having said that, Pakistan endured through Ayub Khan, who said democracy can only flourish in cold climates, not in the hot ones that we have here. In spite of, in spite of Ayub Khan, still we then had a period of democracy, and that was the election of Zulfiqar Ali Bhutto, which was the only meaningful election in Pakistan's history, and democracy was on the way towards getting establishment. Although, although the winner of that election was denied his the rightful winner, place as prime minister. Absolutely. I, ab I completely agree with you that democracy was negated by his refusal to, to acknowledge Mujibur Rahman as the most popular man in Pakistan. But still, democracy has survived. Today, we are going to have elections. Those are going to be rigged elections. They are. But they're better, it's better to have rigged elections than no elections at all. We saw the age of Ziaul Haq. We saw people being whipped and chained and flogged in public. We don't want that to happen. And the only way is to keep democracy going. So that before you respond, because I know there's a couple of questions, but I just want to ask you to respond additionally to the, and I'll ask you guys to respond as well. But Audrey said something similar, Dr. Hoothboy. Uh, said something similar. This idea somehow that, you know, democracy is innately good and that's how good things come to the people might be contested in, in China, which has had the best 
uncontestedly the best economic growth in the world over four decades. Uh, and women in Saudi Arabia would say, who needs elections in the last seven years? Complete transformation in Saudi Arabia, no elections, no democracy. So this idea, I, I do think it's important to contest this idea of some innate God-given quality that the word democracy has when in countries like India and Pakistan and Bangladesh, it has not delivered to the people. And there are plenty of examples where without democracy, it has delivered. So how does that fit into this conversation about democracy no, that's, a, that's, a good, that's a good question, but I, don't, I think that there, there are lots of counterfactuals involved here. Uh, would the Chinese people have been even better off if, uh, if they had had truly representative government? Uh, I think they would have been. Uh, and I, I For me, the most important element is not the question of whether a system delivers or not delivers, but the question of individual freedom, right? Because you can't separate democracy at the systemic level from the, the fundamental human right to have freedom of conscience, freedom of thought, freedom of assembly, freedom of speech, freedom of the press, you take that away, uh, what's the value of life? What's the value of living? So, you know, so, so I think that, that this is a non-debate. Uh, and of course, people who don't have democracy love to, uh, you know, so I've, he I've heard people in China speak uh, I I in this fashion, although interestingly, the Chinese don't deny that they're, they don't, they insist that they are a democracy. Yes. People's democracy, whatever it is, right? So. So I think that this is a settled question. Democracy is fundamental for human welfare. And the challenge before us is how to make democracy meaningful in terms of, you know, not, you know, Dr. Ambedkar in India, uh, founding one of the people who spearheaded the writing of the constitution, uh, you know, made a distinction between a formal, uh, formal democracy and one, uh, you know, uh, in other, and, and you know, in other words, a formal democracy which is somehow captured by money power, and a democracy which is uh, absent, which is free of that kind of control by those who are economically prosperous. Uh, and I think this is the fundamental challenge of our time: that how do you, uh, in, a, in in the United States, for example, devise a system where uh, uh, all the you know uh, companies and lobbyists don't exert the kind of influence that they do? over elections, over policy. Uh, and this is the holy grail for us, rather than to think that we need to abandon or move away from democracy. I, I think a lot of that, I, I'm not sure that the question, there were, one of the questions was, how do we protect democracy? I think the gentleman there, how do we protect democracy from populism is really the essence of the whole panel. You know, I think uh, people, any, like, and you just forget about populism for a second, right? Whether you have Nawaz Sharif or uh, Imran Khan or Musharraf or whoever is in, whoever is in control in any or in Pakistan or a leader in any country, right? People defend their rights and protect themselves by being vigilant, by being assertive, by organizing themselves, uh, by exercising their rights. And I think that the biggest danger that people can make in a democracy is to lower their guard when you have a leader who you think is okay. Uh, democracy, unfortunately, requires. Uh, eternal village, uh, vigilance by people. But, but you had those institutions in America and in India, I think much more advanced than they were in Pakistan. But when the big money, Adani's and, and, and uh, you know, the big money that, you know, came and supported Trump came in, they dismantled some of those civil society institutions and media institutions. I mean, you, you've been part of that, you've been a key figure in, in, in trying to resist that journey of the corporatization and unification of a certain narrative in India. So I think, it, I guess my challenge to you and to all of us to think about, this isn't like, you know, combative in any way, but uh, it's easier to say this, but when we actually try to see it in practice, it's very hard to resist big money and big power and populism. I don't think so. Uh, I think that, yes, it is true 
uh, that in India or in other places, governments have done all they can to, uh, to cement their hold over authority. So in India, for example, uh, the government of Mr. Modi introduced something called electoral bonds, which allows a company to donate anonymously to a political party. The only, only catch is that the government knows who's giving the money, but the opposition doesn't. Right, and so, and this is a, and this is mind blowing to think that a, that a democracy could tolerate this kind of opaque political financing, but it's happening, and the Supreme Court in the last f four or five years in India has not struck this down. So yes, things are getting bad, but I, but I look, you know, I look at the media space, for example, and here I would say in Pakistan, uh, you know, uh, it's possible that uh, many journalists, anchors who are independent minded, find that they have. They don't have much space in, in big media, right? But there is YouTube, there's digital, there's, there's so many other ways of making yourself heard and being impactful and proof of impact. In India, for example, YouTubers are hugely impactful to such an extent that the government now is trying to devise a new law that will allow them to put pressure on YouTube to basically censor YouTubers. Right, so, so this is proof that uh, an alternative strategy of uh, appealing to the, to the people exists and works. Uh, look, I, I think we could go on for hours. Um, if there's not anything urgent that you weren't able to say, then I'll close. But if you want to have uh, kind of a last sort of, you know, 15, 30 second intervention, Navida, maybe. Yeah, just very quickly, um, one of the things that you often hear is, you know, what kind of, uh, si how do we restore civil dis uh, discourse? And I think another question that should com come along with that is, what is the right kind of emotional orientation so as to uh, be oriented towards a democratic outcome? And I think that, you know, being alert, of course, being vigilant of, in of, of uh, for on, on behalf of democratic institutions is very important, but also being alert against despair and resentment. I think those are two of the most scary emotions that I think it can feed into self-perpetuation of populism. And so how is it that one can uh, affect a politics which is not hopelessly or naively optimistic, but has a sort of tragic notion of the world, but is still uh, pessimistically optimistic? I, would I, say. I think that, I, I can't think of it. Did you want to, Audrey, please? Yeah, so I'll just, I'll just say that I think to some degree you have to think about what kind of society you want to live in. Um, and so your mention of Saudi Arabia, that's exactly the kind of society I do not want, right? There is no religious freedom, women are not equal, and everyone is the same, right? There is no room for pluralism and diversity. That's the exact opposite of the sort of diverse pluralistic society with human, religious, and civil rights that I value. In 13 seconds, unless one gives space to the religious minorities, democracy will carry no meaning. It will be majoritarianism. That was even less than 13 seconds. Uh, you know, uh, lots to continue to debate and discuss, including what Saudi Arabia looks like today. So I have a very different view. But I do think that maybe the thing that to me resonated the most is despair and resentment as the absolute evil twin towers of progress. And so I would uh, applaud you, Dr. Navida Khan, Siddharth Vardarajan, Audrey Tushko, and of course, Dr. Pravez Hoodboy for such an enlightening discussion and debate where there was plenty of disagreement. Uh, and you guys have been a fantastic audience. We have the next group here. We're well over time. A round of applause for yourselves and for our panel and for Yakub Bangash and ThinkFest. <laughs>